and then please to Mark chapter 9, New Testament book of Mark chapter 9. This, this morning, this is just a word of exhortation. This, this isn't a big fancy sermon. Uh, you know how I tend to classify, you know, different messages. Some messages fall in my mind under the category of exhortation. Some fall under the category of a sermon or, or a message. Um, they're all a message, but the idea is that uh, a sermon I tend to spend a lot more preparation time on. An exhortation is something the Lord's placed in my spirit, and I don't spend quite as much preparation, but I, I know where I'm going, and the Lord will anoint it, and it'll come out. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14, and if we might stand this morning in honor of the reading of God's Word, and the word of the Lord reads, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. They're all dumb. But anyway... And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him, and saith, O foolish generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when... He saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Master, we love your word this morning. And God, we've come into this place more than just to sing some psalms and to clap our hands, but we've come into this place to hear from heaven, to hear from you. Jesus, as the word of God would go forth at this hour, we pray, God, that your anointing would reside upon your messenger, reside upon the ears of those that would hear. Help us, God, to hear and receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church of this hour. And God, help me to, to deliver it in a manner that will bring glory and honor to your precious name. Master, we ask all this in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this morning. You know, there was, a, there was a movie come out a few few years back that a lot of us rather enjoyed, I think. I think very few people hadn't had some kind of relationship experience at some point, and you hadn't dreamed of filling up a Mercedes with a bunch of somebody's clothes and then dousing them with some gasoline and just set them on fire and just let it burn. <laughs> and that movie was waiting to exhale, you remember? Yeah, that was, that was a good film. Everybody liked that. And, you know, I find as I'm getting older, I'm beginning to realize some things uh, in my ministry and in my life, and I'm realizing that the things of God are not nearly as complicated as people have made them. The things of God are a whole lot more simple than people have made them. I remember growing up in church and the concept of faith to me 
was this big mystical, you know, thing, that faith was this big mystical thing that you had to uh, struggle and strive to try to attain so that you could have faith to believe God for great things. But I've come to realize as I get older that faith is really an extremely simple matter. It's not difficult at all. It's not hard to get at all. It's really a very simple thing. This man came to Jesus and he had great need. His son was demon-possessed. Of course, there's some in today's world tell you that doesn't happen anymore. Well, I've cast enough demons out of people to know it does. I know it does. I've been there. I've spoken. I've seen these things. I don't let them talk to me because I ain't got nothing to say to a demon. I get sick of preachers standing there asking questions of a devil. How stupid is that? What's your name? What's your name? Who cares? Haven't you ever heard the Bible said he's a liar and the father of life? He'll tell you his name's whatever he wants to tell you his name is, you dummy. He'll tell you whatever he wants to tell you. I remember one time dating somebody and being in their home and, and feeling a very strange sensation going on and discerning that something wasn't quite right. Something just felt off. And then I go into the restroom and close the door, and his restroom was on the inside of the house. There were no windows. There was nothing, just strictly on the inside of the house. And as I shut the door, it vacuumed, which indicates that the room is airtight. They literally had it sealed airtight. They even had weather stripping on the bottom of the door. I don't know why they did that, but they did. I guess to keep the moisture concealed or something, you know. And then as I'm... Not to sound ugly or vulgar, but as I'm sitting in the restroom, the shower curtain just started to go. <laughs> like there was a big wind blowing up, but there wasn't no wind. There was no breeze. There was no wind. There was no air. But I'm watching that shower curtain just fly like a flag. Just go whoosh, whoosh. I mean, just big time. Not a little bit, a lot. And I'm watching it, and I said, well... So, well, devil, I guess you're here, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we'll fix that. So I went out, and I told my friend, I said, uh, you're going to think I'm about half crazy. He said, but i got to tell you, you've got some things running around your house that don't need to be here. He said, what do you mean? I said, you've got some spirits floating around here. And I asked him, I said, have you ever engaged, have you ever tried to uh, to employ the services of a psychic or someone that claims to be a medium or something of that nature. He said, no, I've never done that. Have you ever used tarot cards? Have you ever, you know, uh, dabbled with the occult? No, I've never done that. I said, have you ever used a Ouija board? All of a sudden he stopped. He said, well, yeah, that, my, my roommate and I have done that. And I said, well, uh, that's not a real good idea. <laughs> so because I've got news for you. The spirit world is real. But what most people communicate with in the spirit realm is not what they think they're communicating with. They're communicating with one thing, and they're thinking that they're communicating with something entirely different. And I said, and what those demons represented themselves as is not who they genuinely were. And that's about as far as our conversation went concerning that and I told him, I said, I can come and perform an expulsion if you like. I call it an expulsion. It's not a biblical term. It's just a term I made up. It means I expel them. I get them out of there. And because I don't call it casting demons out because it's a house or a property rather than a person. So I just call it an expulsion. I said, I can come perform an expulsion and get rid of this mess for you if you'd like me to. So can you come tomorrow? <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you the part of the story where... He asked me at one point, no, I'm getting there. He asked me at one point if, if I could help him turn his mattress on his bed and because uh, he was wanting to turn the mattress. And, of course, it was like a queen or something. It was too big for him to do by himself, especially if you've seen this little tiny person. He was a little tiny guy, you know. So I helped him turn the mattress. Well, he had just changed some those three-fold screen affairs that people use to decorate their homes and, you know, to separate areas. He had just changed the configuration. He had two of these screens each with three panels, and he had changed the configuration so that rather than uh, them being one and two directly side by side, kind of forming a wall between his living area and the dining area, and then the walkway being through on this side, 
He had just got through changing it so that one was to the left, one was to the right, and the walkway into the dining room was right through the center. But when we came out from the bedroom and turned in the mattress, they were back in their original place. And that scared him to death. So he said, can you come tomorrow? <laughs> That's why he was in such a hurry for me to come. So I came the next day, and I anointed his home with oil, and I told those devils, you have no place here. The only one that's welcome here is the presence of God. That's the only presence that this man wants in his home. You're not welcome here. And as I opened the door to his home and told the spirits to leave, I could feel them almost like human beings. You could almost feel them brushing past you as they left. Didn't see nothing, but I could just feel this presence going past me. But while I was doing the expulsion, there was this word being repeated in my ear constantly. I kept hearing Sam, 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 and it just sounded like a hundred different voices repeating the name Sam over and over and over in my head, just constantly. While I was trying, and it was a distraction, and I knew it was a distraction. Well, as that final one was leaving, you could sense a hesitation like, I don't want to go. And I said, well, tough, because you're going to go. I've told you to get out. Now get out. And he left. It left. Well, a lot of you know the story. When it later, I had conversations with Paul about it, and I said, now, let me tell you some things. I said, number one, he said, well, how many do you think there were? I said, there were three. He said, what sex were they? I said, no, they don't have a gender. I said, there's no such thing as male and female demons. I said, they don't have gender. But I will tell you this, two of them represented themselves as men, and one of them represented themselves as a woman. One of them claimed, the woman claimed that she had died in this property when there was a fire some years ago. I said, man, I don't know how you know that. He said, that's what the Ouija board told us. She said her name was Eve, and she said that she had died here years ago in a fire that this building had burned. I didn't know anything about the history of that building, but I knew what the Holy Ghost told me. And I said, well, that wasn't the case. That was the demon who knew the history of this building. See, demons have been around longer than we have, and they know everybody's history. You know, if somebody, Tommy, if you die and your mom decides to go talk to somebody, you know, James Prague, to, to, in order to talk to you, there's a demon who's been following you around your entire life. He knows every little secret. He knows everything you've ever done. He knows everything you've ever hidden. He knows everything. And he can very, 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 very easily imitate you and make people believe he's you. That's how the devil makes people question God. That's how the devil makes people doubt that what God says in his word is true. Hmm, interesting, huh? The Bible said he's a deceiver. That's his job. And so I said to him, though, I said, Paul, the thing I want to know is who in the world was Sam? And he just looked at me, and he said, I've got to call my roommate, because his roommate was in California on a vacation, visiting with family. He said, I've got to call my roommate. And he gets on the phone with his roommate, and he said, you remember when we were on the Ouija board and all that? He said, well, I've I got a preacher here, a friend of mine. He said, but i got to tell you, he said, there's some really strange stuff going on. He said, how many people did we talk to on that thing anyway? And his friend said, three. He said, how many of them were men and how many of them were women? He said, well, two of them were men and one of them was a woman. He said, didn't that Eve say she died in a fire in this building? Yes. Well, that, mm -hmm, okay. He said, and uh, what was the name of, of that last guy that we talked to so much? And the guy said, Sam. I said, you know what the Bible calls that third person, the third entity that entered your property? The Bible calls him the strong man. That means he's higher up in the hierarchy. It means he's not a private. He's a lieutenant or a sergeant or a general or something. But it, when you get to the point where you let the devil have a door that he can come into, what will happen is after a little bit of time, those spirits are only there to try to open the door more. They're only there to try to get you to open the door even more. And then as the door opens more, then a more powerful spirit's going to come in. One that's even higher up in the in the rankings.
And then when he comes in, I said, he'll take control. I said, I'll bet you a million dollars that the minute you started talking to Sam, you never spoke to Eve again, and you never spoke to Joe again. He said, that's right. How do you know that? I said, because I know what I'm talking about. I've been through this before. I know what I'm talking about. So once the strong man comes in, once the hot shot, the big guy comes in, you'll never talk to the little guys again. Never again. Because now this big guy has got bigger plans for you, and he wants to get the door open so that even bigger fish can swim into this pond. It's a mess. So you see, dealing with the spirit world is not something to be messed with. It is not, you know, people think when churches say that you ought not to deal with psychics and you ought not to deal with these readers and you ought not to deal with tarot cards. Oh, that's just superstition. Oh, that's just stupid. No, it isn't. You're playing with forces you don't know. Well, but it's real. Yes, it is. I'm not telling you it ain't real. I'm telling you it is real. But I'm also telling you that Mr. Van Prague, or whatever his name on television, and little Miss Sylvia Brown and her appearances on Montel Williams, these ignoramuses haven't got a clue what they're dealing with. They really don't. They don't know what they're dealing with. They think they know who they're talking to. They think they know what, you know, entities they're dealing with. Oh, I'm talking to your great Aunt Susan. No, you're not. Honey, if somebody come to me and told me they were talking to my great-grandmother Picanso, I'd say, you're a liar from the pit of hell. My great-grandmother Picanso is dancing around the throne of God right now. She don't have time to be worried about nothing that's going on in this life, and I don't want her to be worried about anything that's going on in this life. When we let her go and let her uh, return to the God from which she came, I want you to know, my friend, I want her to be there. I want her to be happy. I want her to be free from the pain. I want her to be free from all the turmoil of this life. I don't want her down here watching what I'm doing. I don't want her down here seeing what's going on. She is not an angel for me. My Lord have mercy. Isn't that all right? She's where she needs to be. And if you told me she's down here, I'd tell you no she ain't because I know she's not. Because a true born again spirit filled Holy Ghost filled believer is going to be in the presence of their king. They're not going to have time to be down here. My Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. She wouldn't have time to be missing down here. But when you wrestle and deal with uh, spiritual forces, you're, you've got some awful, powerful, difficult dealings. You're, you're dealing with things that can become very problematic for you in very short order. I remember one time a lady in New York City that I cast demons out of at the United Pentecostal Church in Staten Island, New York. I remember she told me that she had been battling a problem in her uh, female parts, I suppose is about the best way I can say it. And she said that she'd gone to the doctor for three or four years and they kept telling her, you're fine. There's nothing down there. You're fine. We've checked it. You're fine. You're fine. And after I cast demons out of the woman one night at the church, I said to her, now go to your doctor. They'll see the problem now. She said, why would they see it now? They haven't. She said, they've been calling me crazy. They've been telling me that I'm crazy, that it's psychosomatic, that it's all in my head. I said, of course they can. Because once you invite a demonic presence into your life, one of the problems they can cause for you is they are literally able to camouflage physical ailments so that doctors can't see them. X-ray machines can't see them. Cat scans can't see them. Oh, that's ridiculous for the moral. Why, nothing is capable of doing that, yeah? This lady went back to her doctor, and her doctor immediately said to her, you've got a, a pelvic infection that looks to be at least three or four years old. She said, how could you have it this long and us not see it? Don't tell me what the devil can and can't do. I know what he can do. So when you're dealing with demonic powers and demonic spirits, friend, you're playing with fire. You don't know what kind of can of worms you're opening and what kind of trouble you can wind up dealing with. But I want you to understand this man came to Jesus this day, and he was dealing with a son who was possessed by a devil from the time that he was just a child. People say, oh, a child can't become demon-possessed. Think again. But I got news for you. It had to start with the parents. The kid didn't open the door. Somebody did, but it wasn't the kid. 
My Bible tells me that a believing parent sanctifies the, the child. My Bible said, the Apostle Paul said, else your children were unclean, but now they are holy. So if you're a believing parent, and if you're a sanctified parent, and if you're a born-again parent, then your child is under the covering. And if you're not, your child's opened all kind of stuff. And that's obviously what happened here. This man was not a believer, at least from the beginning, but at some point in his life, he came to believe on Jesus, and he came to the Lord for help. And the Lord's response to him was very simple. He said, uh, you know, my child is possessed and I, I need your assistance. If there's anything you can do, please have mercy and do it. And the Lord returned and said, if you can believe. See, faith. It's all about faith. I want you to know today that the Lord could have just as easily answered this man that afternoon or morning, whatever it was, and simply said to him, just breathe. Just breathe. Just take a breath. You know why? Because that's how easy faith is. It's as easy as breathing. When I, help, when I finish this morning, I hope you'll understand what I'm saying. Faith is just as simple as taking your next breath. It is so common to you, you wouldn't believe how common it is to you. And we think it's this big spiritual principle that's so hard to understand, when in reality it is so easy to get. And before you leave here in the next few minutes, I'm going to help you understand what I mean. Faith is a part of our everyday lives. We learn to trust and believe our parents as we grow up. When they say to do a certain thing, we believe they're saying so for our benefit and for our good. Faith is not a supernatural commodity, but it is a substance that can work in supernatural realms. See, faith is something we deal with every single day. There's not a one of us that doesn't make a decision every single day to do or not do something based on the word of somebody else. Hello now. Every day we have to choose to believe the word of somebody. And all we're trusting and all we're believing is what they say. That's all we have to go on. But mother, you work with Joanne and you say, but Joanne's a good girl. I like Joanne. I know Joanne. I believe Joanne. I trust Joanne. So if Joanne said to you, Donna, you need to do so and so, you're going to do it. Because you trust that individual. And you know that you can count on them to be looking out for your best interest. And your mom and your dad, when your mom and your dad come and they say something to you, you immediately trust them and you believe them. And you'll do what they ask you or tell you to do because you know that your best interests are at heart. Faith is part of Every single day that we live, we go to work and we have faith and we have confidence in our employer or in our supervisor. We have faith and we have confidence in our partner or in our, our, our husband or our wife because it's part of life. So God's not asking us to find something we don't already have. What he's asking us to do is exercise what we already have in his direction. He's saying, if you can believe, that's what Jesus is saying. He didn't say, if you can find some supernatural faith that comes from God, bless God, and, and you've got to fight with the angels to get it, glory to God. That's not what he said. He said, if you can believe, if you can trust my word like you can trust the word of your mama and your papa, if you can trust my word like you trust the word of your wife, if you can trust my word like you trust the word of your employer, if you can believe me, you can have it. And that's what God is saying us to us today. He said, faith is so simple. It's like breathing. It's something we do automatically. It's something we do every day. He said, but now, when it comes to me, just breathe. Hallelujah. Just let it out in my direction. Just release it toward me and see what I can do. I've said it. Now try me and see if I won't do what I said I'll do. Whew. Isn't that exciting? Isn't it simple when you understand just how easy faith really is? 
People say, well, Lord, you say in your word you're a healer. You say in your word, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church, anoint them with oil and pray. Prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. Mom had an eye infection, whatever it was going on last week. And come, what was it, Tuesday night, Bible study night? She said, I, I want you to anoint me and pray for me before we leave. So we did. And she wakes up the next day, and her eyes cleared up. You see, it's not a hard thing. It's a simple thing. It's not, a, it's not, there's, it's not magic. This isn't a big voodoo, you know. This is just a very simple matter. God is just saying, saying, if you can direct your faith and confidence toward me the way that you do in your everyday life toward everybody else, the problem that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden was that they believed the serpent. He said it, they believed it. They bought it. <laughs> they say, okay, you said it, we believe it. And forgetting all about what God had said. Now it's sad, I'll tell you, it's sad when you want to talk about a deceiver. It's sad when the devil can remind you what God said and you still forget what God said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the devil said, didn't the Lord say in the, if you eat that you're going to die? Well, no, that ain't the case. Well, duh, he just told you what God said, and you still turned around and believed him over the Lord. But you see, there's so many people in this life that don't experience, are we a miracle church? Oh, yes, we are. I've seen a lot of miracles in my life. I've seen a lot of miracles in my ministry. I've seen God heal people of everything, breast cancer. I mean, man, I could go down a list of them how long. I've seen God touch people and heal people. You know why? Because it's as easy as breathing your next breath. It's just a matter of whether you want to exercise confidence in God and put faith and confidence toward God like you do everybody else in your life. But we got people in this world who they can trust their boss, they can trust their mama, they can trust their papa, they can trust their partner, they can trust their husband, they can trust their wife, they can trust their car, they can trust the door, they can trust the light switch, but they can't trust God. My Lord, have mercy. That's right, I said the light switch. Because when you go to the light switch and flip it, you have faith that it is somehow going to cause that light to come on. If you didn't believe that that was going to happen, you wouldn't waste your time flipping the switch. Hello now. Right? You get in your car and you got faith in your vehicle because you take out that little thing called the key and you put it in the ignition and you turn it and you fully expect that it's going to start. And when it doesn't, you're shocked. And aggravated. And, first, and some of us cuss and carry on like crazy people because it won't start, right? But why? Because we had every confidence it was going to. That's why the Bible said an unbelieving man, a double-minded man, is unstable in all his ways. That's why the Word of God says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. If you're getting in the car and you're figuring, oh, it might start, it might not, then guess what? It might, it might not. It might, it might not. At some point, the dumb thing going to stop working. So one of these days, your expectation is going to be realized. Am I telling the truth? So it's all about how you approach things. And if, if we can exercise faith every day, if we can walk and live by faith, all of us are living by faith, even the unbeliever. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Even the sinner on the highway and in the streets and out there in the community, they're all living by faith. It's just a matter of where their faith is pointed, in which direction they have their faith focused. My Lord, have mercy. That's why I like what old Joshua said. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to believe God if it kills me. I'm going to trust God if it kills me. I made up my mind. I made up my mind. I made up my mind. Tried to do it on my own. Didn't work out too well. So now I'm going to just believe God, and I have every confidence it will end good. Amen. It's all about just where are you going to direct your faith? Where are you going to put your faith? Where are you going to put your confidence? Are you able like this man who came to Jesus? 
said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, I like to word that like this. Lord, I know you can, but help me to know you will. Because I preached over the years to a lot of people. I said, I'll tell you, I've seen more miracles stop dead at the front door because people knew God could, but they weren't sure he would. Yeah. Amen. If you got it in your head that you're undeserving and you're on, un how many people live in today with HIV and AIDS and they feel undeserving of God's healing touch? They've allowed preachers and and uh, those on television and what have you to preach them into despair and hopelessness and they believe that, well, after all, I did bring it on myself. So did the fool with lung cancer. So did the woman with her peace. Come on now, sounds ugly, but it's the truth. Honey, if God didn't fix our mistakes, if God didn't cover our mis uh, missteps and our failings, then, sweetheart, the entire world would just collapse on itself. Don't worry about why it come on you. Just know that God is able to deal with it now that it's here. Hallelujah. God is able to do what you need to be done. And don't let the devil rob you of a miracle or of a blessing all because of you because. God won't do that for you because. My response to that is, devil, that's exactly why God will do it for me. That's exactly why God will do it for me, because he's my father. And if I can believe my daddy would pull me up out of a mud hole, or if I would believe my daddy would pull me up out of quicksand, if I believe my daddy would rescue me from drowning and not allow me to drown, then you better believe I believe my heavenly father. My Bible said that he delivereth my life from destruction. Hallelujah. I want you to know God's in the business of covering my back. God is in the business of taking care of my business. God is in the business of doing for me what I cannot do. So devil, it don't matter why I am where I am. God is here for me. Get out of my face. I'm going to believe God. Hallelujah. Whoa, oh, glory, just breathe. I got to remind myself once in a while or else I'd pass out preaching. <laughs> The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, Now faith is the substance, the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. This isn't a supernatural thing. This is everyday things. It is the substance of things hoped for. It's why we flip the light switch. Because we have faith that the light will come out. So the substance of our faith is in our flipping the light switch. If we didn't have any faith, we wouldn't flip the switch. But because we have faith, we put substantive action behind it. That's why in James chapter 2, James tells us faith without works is dead, being alone. Because faith is substance. Faith is action. Faith, you can't have faith without action. It's impossible to divorce the two. So he says, if you've got faith, you're going to flip the switch. And if you flip the switch, you got faith. I remember before we got the electric turned on here, and it took us a while to get the electric turned on here, they got some crazy rules in Mesquite about how to do things. I used to come in, to the building, and I remember, you know, I, I think, well, maybe the electric company got to us, and and they just didn't know that that they weren't supposed to. And I flipped the switch and wait to see if the lights come on. Nope. <laughs> well, okay. And then finally, I talked to the electric company, and they're scheduled to come, you know. And I knew I'd have to be here for the guy and all that. But I'd think, well, maybe they turned it on, and the guy didn't really need to be here after all. And I'd flip that switch. But nope. The light still didn't come on. But you know what? I knew at some point, one day, oh, glory, one day, I was going to flip that switch, and it was going to come on. 
I knew one day, Tommy, I might flip it a thousand times and get nothing. But one day, I'm going to flip that bloody switch and the lights are going to come on. One day, it's going to happen. I have faith. Hallelujah. I believe. Glory to God. That's what faith is all about. You ever waiting for your phone to be turned on? You're so excited you keep lifting the stupid receiver and listening? <laughs> Honey, I've had more dead phones to my ear than anybody in my life. Anybody I know. I just love with them. Not yet. Because I just knew I was going to catch it at the right second. I just knew that at the very moment that I picked it up, there I was going to hear that wonderful, melodious tone. Like a bee buzzing in my ear. I just knew I was going to hear that glorious music, the sound of angels singing. That's faith. Every time you go to your phone and you pick it up to make a telephone call, you've got faith. And you're exercising faith. Isn't it a shame when we can exercise faith in equipment? Come on now. Man-made equipment. We can exercise faith in this little thing on the bob here and believe that when we hit a certain button, it's going to do exactly what we're telling it to do. Of course, that faith is misdirected, and most of the time I hit a button, it does something completely different. But the point is, but we, have, we exercise faith every day. Every single day we live by faith and we walk by faith and we act in faith and we can believe man-made equipment. We can trust man-made highways. You ever get up on some of them high-rise highways that are 100,000 feet in the air and, you know, and you're watching uh, the birds fly along that are migrating and they're below you rather than above you and you're way up there somebody you're going around this big curve like this and <laughs> and as scary as that is we get on those things every day and we believe that it'll stay up as long as we're on it anyway or at least we hope and it does usually but see, we live with faith every minute of every day. But where do we direct our faith? Where do we put our faith? We put it in man-made things. We put it in the highways. We put it in the bridges. We put it in the tunnels that men have dug. We put it in the buildings that men have built. But honey, in 2001, we should have learned our lesson that what man has put up, uh, man is just as quickly able to take down. Why in the world can we put our confidence in buildings and structures and in mechanisms and in machinery? Why can we put our confidence in human beings who are just as much flesh and blood and fallible and faulted as you and I are? How can we put our confidence in all of these things and somehow not find it in our hearts to trust God and to believe God and to turn to God? The Bible said, you have not because you ask not. So the Lord says, there's one real simple reason why you haven't got what you, what you want, what you need. say because you haven't asked for it. You know why we don't ask? Because we don't have confidence in God to give it to us. How many times my mother has said that she remembers growing up and it seemed like Praying about finances was something you weren't supposed to do because it was like that was almost too trivial for God to be bothered with. So see, if you've got it in your mind that God won't be bothered with financial issues, if you've got it in your mind that God don't want to be bothered with this or that, then guess what? You're not going to ask him about those things. And as long as the devil can have you convinced that God is not to be bothered with those things, you're never going to get them. To so see. Because we have not, because we ask not, because it's about faith. I'm going to say this this morning, and then I'm going to come to a close. You remember, the Scripture tells us, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of church. One principle I've abided by for as many years as I've been in ministry, I don't anoint a soul with oil and pray for them until they've asked me to do so. 
Not a soul, not one person. You will never see me stand up in front of church when we have a hundred people or a thousand people. You will never see me stand up there and say, well, if you're sick, come on down and we'll anoint you with oil. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Why? Because that's faith. That's action. That's putting that finger under the light switch and getting ready to flip it. You got me? If I go and flip the switch for you, then what good has it done you? You understand what I'm saying? You know why so many people in Pentecostal churches have gone up for prayer and so many services and turned around and went back to their seat and dropped dead a few days later? Because they're not doing things God's way. I've always, 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 always insisted you want to be healed, you want the Lord to touch you, all you have to do is ask for prayer. Ask to be anointed with oil and prayed for, and the Lord will touch you. I believe it with every ounce of my being. God will heal you. I believe it with every ounce. But you never see me offer people for prayer to anoint people with oil. You never see me offer. Uh uh. Never. Because it's not appropriate. You're, you're supposed to exercise faith first by asking. Then it's my job to anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. And the Lord said that He will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. You see, then I'm agreeing with you. I'm going and I'm saying, all right, I'm, I'm in conjunction with your faith. I'm working with you. I'm agreeing with you. And the Bible said we're two or three agree as touching any one thing. It shall be done unto them. Not it might be done. It shall be done. It could be done. It shall be done. It, it, there's a good potential it could be done. No, it shall be done. It's all about agreeing in faith. So then faith cometh by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the word of God. I'll tell you one of the reasons why the Bible, the, Jesus said that when he returns, will he find faith in the earth? I'll tell you one of the reasons why he's not going to find a whole lot of faith, because most preachers are preaching trash. Amen. They're not preaching the word of God, because if they were preaching the word of God, there'd be faith. So you can get up and preach all the condemnation and all the guilt and all the negativity you want to, my friend, but I've got news for you. That doesn't generate or produce faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God nowhere in his word says, I am the God that sendeth thee to hell. He says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. He says, I am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. That's good news. Everything God says is positive. Everything God says is good news. Everything God says you can take to the bank. Everything God says you can exercise faith in and receive something in response. But when you get all these preachers out there preaching a bunch of garbage and trash, listen to some of these messages, some of these TV knuckleheads are preaching. Honey, they ain't nothing. If you listen to what they're preaching, what do they expect me to exercise faith in so I can get from God. Listen to the message and think that in your head. Think to yourself. Now, what's Rod Parsley telling me that I, should believe in, that I should be believing God for? What is God telling, uh, uh, Parsley telling me that I should be receiving from God in response to this message? Hell. That's what half of them are all about. It's condemnation for everybody. Oh, I see, so that's the good news. I'm going to hell. <laughs> Woohoo! I kind of would have preferred Disneyland, but hey. <laughs> but you see, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I've had over the years that I've been pastoring, we've seen so many things. God's done so many things in, my, in the churches that I've pastored. And I have people say, what's the secret? I said, I'll tell you what the secret is. Preach the Word. Preach the word. If you preach the word, then faith is the natural byproduct of preaching the word. Not just faith, but faith in God is the natural byproduct of preaching the word. If you preach the word, then there'll be faith. And if there's faith, there'll be miracles. And if there's miracles, there's going to be deliverances and there's going to be healings. And you're going to see miraculous things. But if you're preaching a bunch of man-made claptrap, don't expect to see very much. Amen? So this morning I want to encourage us all, just breathe. 
Believe in God. It's as easy as that. Understand this morning. You believe 